As you all know, prostate cancer is the second leading cause of cancer deaths in men in America today. What some of you may not realize is uh, that there are less than 100 prostate cancer specialists in the whole United States. And we're lucky enough to have one right in our backyard at Marina Del Rey with Dr. Mark Schultz. Dr. Mark Schultz was born and raised in Southern California. He went to college at local universities and finished his medical schooling at USC. He's the principal investigator in clinical trials involving astrocentin, two trials with ipilimumab, two trials with abiraterone, oral MDV 3100, modified citrus pectin, taxir versus mitoxantrum, and more recently, ProHinge. He's also been interviewed on several TV talk, show, uh, talk shows, including US News and World Report, News Talk, Health Talk, and Breakfast News. Dr. Schultz is the medical director of Prostate Oncologist Specialists, a group practice in Marina Del Rey. He is also co-founder of the Prostate Cancer Research Institute, better known as PCRI, and co-sponsors the annual National Prostate Cancer Conference. Undisputedly the best prostate cancer conference in the nation, with the best of the best doctors attending and making presentations. Dr. Schultz is also co-author of the newly published book entitled Invasion of the Prostate Snatchers. No more unnecessary biopsies, radical treatment, or loss of sexual potency. Now, I noticed when he came in tonight, I sent him an email and I said, please bring some books with you because I'm sure some people out there would like to purchase them. You didn't bring books, did you? Oh well, you know, he's got a lot on his mind. He's treating a lot of patients up there, fighting the traffic to get here for your pleasure tonight, so we'll excuse him. But if you want to rent one of these books, you can rent them outside for $20, and then if, when you bring the book back, we'll give you your $20 back. We buy them from Dr. Schultz. He actually, I'm not supposed to say this, he donated a few of them for our, our use. But anyway, uh, you can rent them here, or I can get you information later, or contact Dr. Schultz's office on how to buy them directly from his office. I would like to let you know about his credits for scientific papers and major speech that he's given. However, I'd be reading here for an awful long time. So I'd just like to show you a little list of these papers and major speeches. Now. <laughs> I'll pick that up in a minute. Tonight, Dr. Schultz will present the latest information on dealing with advanced prostate cancer and treating recurrent disease. He will describe effective chemotherapy combinations for the advanced disease, in addition to the promising new investigational agents available in clinical trials. Additionally, Dr. Schultz will cover new immunological approaches for advanced <laughs> metastatic prostate cancer and for men with simple PSA relapse. You know, I saw that on here, simple PSA relapse. There is no such thing, but that's what, that's what the note said, so that's what I read. He will also, also offer very practical information about interpreting clinical trial results and will provide guideline, guidelines on how individuals with prostate cancer can help decide what treatments to take or even when to stop and move on to another option. It is my pleasure to present to you Dr. Mark Schultz. I'm going to take it with me on the road. Thank you. Uh, can I have a list, list background? Yeah. Incidentally, this thing didn't unroll all the way. It only unrolled halfway. I got a lot more to show you yet. More for next time. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. That was great. All right. Well, he practically gave the whole talk already, so we're... Uh, we're going to, well, we'll just jump right into this. Uh, the book that he showed you is for men that have 
uh, newly diagnosed prostate cancer. And the, uh, the thing that motivated me to get into that, apart from my uh, patient, Ralph Blum, grabbing me in the hall one day and, and running that ridiculous name by me to see if I would participate in this project, uh, I, uh, I was motivated a lot by concerns about patients that are already diagnosed and who have friends who get diagnosed and then go rushing into treatment. And so many of my patients have been chagrined and, and concerned about how, um, how treatment gets rushed along. And so the book, the theme of the book is really sort of a uh, go slow, think it through, and look at all the options type of a book. And so it's really in many ways written for men that already have prostate cancer, that are concerned about other people that are newly diagnosed. I wanted to put a tool in uh, your guys' hands that you felt you could give to someone to help them slow down. I, my patients so often, every week someone would come in complaining that a friend of theirs had been diagnosed and they rushed immediately into treatment and, the, uh, and there was, despite all their you know, counsel and encouragement to wait and to get several opinions. So that's what the book is about. Uh, but tonight's talk is going to be about relapse disease or um, more advanced prostate cancer. So it's a different topic really altogether. I think of prostate cancer in three broad categories. The newly diagnosed, the men that, um, and that would include the men that are on active surveillance because they always have all their options in front of them. The second category is the men that have a rising PSA after treatment, the relapse people. And then the third category, the people that have hormone resistant or metastatic disease. So we'll cover the latter two categories. And there's no way you can do an exhaustive talk, it's such a big field, but we're gonna hit the high points. And I'm gonna emphasize uh, the most effective treatments and treatments that are available now. Sometimes if you have people talking to you about uh, the new things in prostate cancer, you'll hear about stuff that's coming or around the corner. But uh, everything that we talk about tonight is available to prostate cancer patients right now. So we'll just jump right into it with that. And I've already sort of pointed this out. And we're going to be talking about this latter group of people with the advanced uh, stages, not the, uh, not the clinically localized. One of the encouraging things about prostate cancer in my um, experience, I've been doing this about 20 years now, is how many new things are coming out and how quickly they're being developed. I've seen more new things in the last two to four years that I've seen in all my previous career. And I expect that that accelerated approval of new treatments is going to continue. And it's exciting because these new treatments are less toxic, more effective, and because they're less toxic, it creates the opportunity for us to use them in combination. So combinations of treatment are gonna be more effective. What's limited us in the past is the treatments are often too toxic to give combinations. So, but when you can start combining multiple effective treatments, you're going to get much better results. Just an example of how slow things have been in the FDA approved treatments for prostate cancer, we had one in the 1980s and one in the 1990s, and then of course in the 2000s we had Taxotere come along, and then just this year uh, we had um, the approval of ProBench, which we'll talk about. And we expect to have a rabarone, another new pill, a more potent um, hormone type pill, excuse me, will uh, be approved in the next few months as well. And I should also, uh, I suppose, announce that uh, the Johnson & Johnson that bought abiraterone, I think of abiraterone sort of like a um, non-toxic type of ketoconazole. How many in the room have heard of a medicine called ketoconazole? That's pretty good. Ketoconazole is an FDA approved antibiotic. It's probably the most potent and effective hormone treatment if Lupron and Casadex stop working. People in the room that don't know what Lupron and Casadex is, raise your hand. Okay, so we've got a couple. Um, Lupron and Casadex are the most common hormone treatments uh, that are used to treat uh, prostate cancer, and they're very, very effective, and they usually continue to be effective for a number of years. If they stop working, however, there are other treatments Ketoconazole has been a popular backup plan. And uh, the, I think that abiraterone, this new pill that Johnson & Johnson will probably get approved in the next few months, will supplant ketoconazole because it has a lot less side effects and it works just as well or perhaps better than ketoconazole does. So that's an exciting breakthrough. Uh, the Johnson & Johnson that approved the um, 
that will get this medicine approved in the next few months has kindly um, is going to release the medicine in the next couple of weeks on a compassionate use basis for uh, men that, are, that have had previous chemotherapy, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute. And so if, um, if people have had Taxotere that has stopped working, uh, Johnson, and Zon Johnson will put you on this trial, allow you to get the medicine free of charge. So anyone that has had Taxotere here and it's not working for them any longer, they might want to call. Our office will be the first office to have access to this medicine. There will be other offices, and probably USC and UCLA will be opening up in the next few months, but we'll be having it probably within about two weeks. So you can call us if you're in that circumstance. So I'm not going to say too much more about abiraterone. I'm going to go on now and talk about the most common chemotherapy used to treat prostate cancer. Chemotherapy is just the name of a medicine to kill cancer. Uh, it has a, a kind of a nasty overtone, just like radiation, uh, which has gotten a lot better. Chemotherapy treatments have gotten a lot better and more effective. And I want to talk about, a little bit about Taxotere because it's, um, and there's a lot of things that are misunderstood about it. And there's many things that are misunderstood about the way the FDA approves new medicines. Um, and that has to do with the fact that um, the FDA demands that uh, pharmaceutical companies compare a new medicine with a standard old medicine to see if one group of people lives longer than the others. The only way they'll approve a new medicine is if you can show a group of patients that will have longer survival than patients who have uh, received a standard or an alternative treatment. So Taxotere got to be true because it was a, uh, compared to a medicine called mitoxantrone, uh, and they uh, had uh, well, 1,006 patients you can see here. Is there a pointer up here? Yeah. Okay. Figure out how to use it. Yeah. So they had 1,006 patients, 335 of these got taxatere every three weeks, another 300 or so got taxatere weekly, that's not on the thing, another 300 or so got this old medicine called minoxantrone. And then they, after they treated these different groups, they watched to see if one group lived longer than the rest, figuring that if they live longer, that means the medicine actually is uh, useful and that the FDA will be willing to approve it. Uh, the type of patients that are in this trial, average age about 68, the average PSA was in the low hundreds, and about 90% had positive bone scans. So these are people with, with more advanced disease, and what they found, this is a survival curve, I'm going to show you a few of these tonight because you always hear about these survival curves, and the, um, this is a percentage of people still alive over time. So you can see how the, when the curves start to separate, the people on Taxotere have better survival, 27% improvement in two-year survival. So this is what led to the almost immediate FDA approval. As soon as they can show the FDA a trial like this, the FDA will approve it. And that's uh, how all the uh, prostate cancer things are getting approved. The trouble is that the, the amount of survival difference is only a few months. And so, a lot of times people look at that and they say, well, Taxotere has side effects. It can cause hair loss, it can cause tiredness, it can cause, um, sometimes it can cause you lose the uh, taste for food, uh, and uh, there are even other side effects. And so, the price of admission for a few extra months of survival seems to be, you know, maybe it's not worth it. And this de debate has raged on and on because the trial design to look at one group of people that gets medicine A, one group that gets medicine B, and see if there's any real difference. Not a lot of difference, just any real difference is what the FDA requires. It isn't really, however, showing what these medicines can do. It's only meeting the demands that the FDA is asking for. So the FDA is kind of asking like for a horse race. They want to see the new medicine gets to the finish line earlier than the, um, of the older type of treatment. So if someone has an um, advanced form of prostate cancer with, you can see the spots of cancer throughout the bones, this is a bone scan, and then after treatment all the spots go away and the person goes into a complete remission, this would not convince the FDA to approve a new medicine. That, that's not good enough for the FDA. So this is meaningless to the FDA. You can only do a trial like I described if you want to get FDA approval. So. What about this four-month thing? What does that really mean? Well, the, um, 
determination of who's going to benefit from something like Taxotere can usually be elucidated in a couple months after starting the treatment by a good old-fashioned methodology called a drop in PSA. PSA in these patients it was about 100. It's usually going to start dropping after a few months if the medicine is working. And it's been shown that if you can get just a simple 30% decline in PSA on, for the men on Taxotere, compared to the ones that don't get a decline, that's this group here, you can see the survival curves are identical to the older medicine if there's no drop in PSA. But if you get just a simple 30% decline in PSA, you can see the survival curves are different. In fact, they're quite a bit different now. Not just a four-month difference, but a much larger, um, let's see if I can read it off the scale here, it looks like about a 10-month difference. So what happens, that little four-month thing that they keep quoting includes all the people that were on Taxotere but never got any benefit from it, their PSA never went down. So it waters down the benefit when you compare it with the, the uh, patients who do have at least the decline. So in, in an oncologist's everyday office, we don't just keep treating people if it's not working. We'll give people treatment for 60 days. And if the PSA doesn't start to decline, we'll stop it and we'll go to a different type of treatment or we'll modify it or we'll try and find something that is working because if it's not working, why would you continue, continue it? So this idea of when you go into tax care that you're only going to get four months of additional life is, is not a, a real accurate representation of what these medicines can do. Now here's an example of in the 700 patients that had tax care, I remember there were some that got weekly and some got every three weeks. 115 of them had their PSAs drop all the way down to less than four. Remember the average starting PSA was 120 or something like that. So in these 115 patients, the average improvement, see how the survival curves now. These are the people that didn't have any drop in PSA. And these are the 115 patients that had their PSA drop to less than four. The average survival difference there is 20 months. So, sounds like a much more valuable thing. So, it seems to conclude, well, the average change in survival is only four months, so I'm not going to bother with this medicine. Well, within 60 days, you're going to know if you're going to be a responder or not, whether you're going to get some real benefit, not just a couple months. So, it's, it's really pretty laughable that people go around saying tax care only buys you four months. It's like, you know, when you go into a math class and say, well, the average for this math class is a C, so I can't get more than a C. So I'm, you know, I'm just not going to go to that math class. I'll get a C. Because everyone, the average is a C in that class. Well, how do you know you're average? No one knows until you try. So I want to also comment on the fact that there are some other ways to determine when you start a new medicine. This is one of the principles I'd like to get across tonight. Because uh, I see patients come into the office and they've been treated somewhere else. And someone put them on something like Taxotere or, or, or Ketoconazole or something like that. And the PSA is going up and up and up and up, month after month. And I just don't understand why no one has thought about, well, maybe we better stop this treatment and try something else. I mean, it sounds so painfully obvious, but it's, it happens all the time. If the PSA is continually rising, almost certainly what you're doing isn't working. And there are also a number of other uh, me uh, methods besides PSA to double check if something is working or not. I've listed them for you here. PSA is here. There's also uh, PAP, another type of blood test, LDH, another type of blood test, alkaline phosphatase or ALP, another type of blood test. All these medicines tend to go down when the cancer is getting better and go up when the cancer is getting worse. We have a new test now where they can actually measure cancer cells in the blood. And when that's going up, as you can imagine, that's not good. If there's more cancer cells in the blood, that's a bad sign. And if you start a treatment and the cancer cell numbers drop, that's a good sign. So this is called circulating tumor cells. And then you're all familiar with bone scans, PET scans, CAT scans, MRIs. Um, those things will improve. I showed you how one scan improved a minute ago. Obviously, those things are a good sign in an individual, even though the FDA isn't using that uh, in the day-to-day -day practice. It's very important. Uh, there's some other uh, blood tests, for, especially for a type of cancer called small cell, CEA, NSE, CGA, and those should be checked periodically. And then, of course, if people have any sore spots, 
usually the earliest sign that a treatment is helping is that the pain goes away. And it usually will start to improve just within 10 to 14 days, long before you even see changes in blood test results. So these are all part of the big picture rather than just looking only at PSA and trying to determine what is working and what isn't. Okay, so F uh, FDA approved Taxotere. Taxotere is the mainstay of treatment, but it, uh, as you can see, 100 of the 700 patients treated had their PSAs drop all, all the way to normal. I think about 50% of the patients treated had at least a 30% decline, so it had a benefit. So about half the patients took the Taxotere and it didn't seem to help them. So what are we going to do about those people? Or what do we do about the people who are on the Taxotere and it's working for a period of time and then it stops working? Well, the natural thing to consider is adding something to the Taxotere to try and restore its activity. There have been a number of trials done and I'm just going to show a couple of medicines to you real quickly that are frequently used in conjunction with Taxotere to get better results. And the, um, uh, and this, a particular study, you, uh, you can, there's four studies right here that I've listed for you. Uh, and these are medicines that have platinum in them. And in particular, a medicine called carboplatin, another called oxyplatin. And the um, uh, studies were done in a way uh, that, uh, in this particular study, for example, if people had had a lot of previous chemotherapy, they didn't get as good a result. So you can see the response rate was only 18%. If patients were, had only one previous uh, treatment and they got treatment, at carboplatin and then said, in this particular trial of 40 patients, almost everybody benefited. And here's another one where they used carboplatin and about two-thirds of the patients benefited. So this medicine, when it's added to Taxotere, is quite effective. This medicine, which is FDA approved for colon cancer, not for prostate cancer, was intriguing because these patients had a lot of previous chemo but two-thirds of them also benefited. So you can restore the activity of Taxotere by adding carboplatin, which is uh, um, you know, available, it's FDA approved, and uh, can be uh, used in conjunction with Taxotere. There's another medicine that's used to treat breast cancer called Zolota. This is a pill, and in some trials, 30 patients in this trial, 77 in this one, and 50 patients in this trial, these patients had much higher response rates, you can see, that I mentioned that you get about a 50-50 response rate with Taxotere alone. Um, in two of the three trials, you can see that the response rates were substantially higher than that. So this is another medicine that we found useful in adding the Taxotere to try and get better results than just Taxotere alone. The, there's some other medicines. If, how many of you in the room have heard of something called angiogenesis? Okay, angiogenesis is about half. Angiogenesis means that uh, basically the tumors can't grow unless they get blood supply, and they can't grow bigger unless the blood su supply is increased. New blood vessels have to form. And so intelligent researchers came up with the idea of instead of attacking the cancer cells, let's attack the blood vessels so that they can't get the feeding that they need. So a couple of common angiogenesis inhibitors, one called thalidomide, another called Avastin, have shown activity uh, with uh, Taxotere. For example, in this particular study, they, 75 men volunteered to either get Taxotere alone, 25 of them, or Taxotere plus thalidomide, which is a pill that has some angiogenesis properties. And what they found is that when the Taxotere was added to the, uh, when the thalidomide was added to the Taxotere, the 18 month survival jumped up significantly and the percentage of patients with a drop in PSA um, was also augmented as well. So this thalidomide improved the results with Taxotere. Avastin is, uh, is FDA approved for colon cancer, but available for prostate cancers here uh, in Southern California. This is a, um, a medicine that was, uh, uh, yeah, I probably should, can't go into how it was created, it's very complex, but uh, this was studied in one trial of 60 men who were given not only uh, Taxotere and Thalidomide, but also this new medicine of Avastin, which is another angiogenesis inhibitor. And these men had a very aggressive type of prostate cancer. Their PSA was doubling, on average, for the 60 men, every one and a half months. Okay, so that means that within 45 days, the PSA would go from 10 to 20. 
Another 45 days, it would go from 20 to 40. And then another 45 days, it would go from 40 to 80. This is really aggressive cancer. Average PSA at the time of starting was about 100. And when they were treated with the combination of taxic hair plus Avastin, plus thalidomide, 90% of the men respond. This is the, each line is uh, the percentage decline in PSA for each of the individual patients. So you can see the orange ones are the only ones that didn't have at least a 50% decline. And you can see they probably, um, well 90% of the men responded, but many of them had 80 and 90 and, and greater responses. Very, very potent combination. So the makers of Avastin then tried to um, do a trial to see if they could get specific FDA approval for, the, for this drug. And they had got 1,000 patients to volunteer to take Taxotere and Avastin and compared it to Taxotere alone. Docetaxel is the same thing as uh, Taxotere, it's a trade name for it. And so unfortunately in this trial they didn't include any thalidomide and what they found was that the survival, there was a slight improvement in survival, but not much, we've looked at these, a uh, couple of these, now you can see that the lines from the tax and Avastin compared to the tax alone are almost on top of each other. Little improvement, but not enough to even uh, to establish that it's effective. They did show that the rate of cancer progression was slower in the patients that were on the uh, Avastin and tax but the survival was borderline. So Avastin was not able to um, achieve the status for FDA approval, but it is still, because it was FDA approved for colon cancer, we can still get it for our patients here in Southern California and use it with, usually not with uh, uh, thalidomide, but a new generation called Re uh, Revlimid, which I'll go into in a minute. Now before we talk about that, I want to talk about a medicine that's going to become available only in trial form here in about the next... I think in the next couple of weeks, this trial will open up. This is a new medicine to try and improve the effectiveness of tax tear. It, it's amazing what the scientists are coming up with now. The uh, tax tear stops working, uh, be, apparently because of a particular molecule in the cell called clusterin. And this clusterin somehow degrades the tax tear. So after the cancer cell has been eating the taxotere for a while and some of them have died off, it gets smart and it starts making this, this uh, protein called clusterin and the taxotere stops working. So some geniuses in the laboratory said, well why don't we um, go after this particular thing, see if we can get rid of it, using something, I'll see if I can pronounce it, antisense oligonucleotides. I'm sure that explains it for you. The, uh, what this basically means, it's almost like a back to the future concept. I don't know if you all saw the movie Back to the Future, you know, but in those futuristic films, someone's always going into the past to try and change the past so that they can erase someone in the future. Well, proteins are created out of RNA, and RNA is created out of DNA. So almost all the medicines throughout the history of mankind have been designed to block proteins directly, to put some kind of a thing that'll stick on the surface of the protein so it stops working. But this idea was to go back and get it at the RNA and the DNA stage so that it never gets created. And the way they do that, I think I have some cartoons that will explain that, is the, uh, uh, this is the, uh, uh, a picture of RNA making a protein. So, our, uh, so proteins, the cluster in protein comes from RNA, and RNA comes from DNA. So the, if you can get rid of the RNA, you can get rid, there'll never be any cluster. So the way they figured out how to do that is by, uh, when the RNA comes off, the RNA is created from the DNA, and then it floats out into the cell where it gets, the, the RNA gets turned into a protein. So what they created is this medicine called, they've called it Kirstersen. And Kirstersen is like the, the mirror opposite of the RNA for clustering. And what happens is because it's the mirror opposite, is it sticks to the clustering, the clustering RNA, not the protein. And so basically like super glue, ties it up, and then the protein transcription can never happen. So it basically eliminates cholesterol 
from, the, from inside the cancer cell. So this means then that this protein that is in high concentration in cancer cells that breaks down taxotere never comes into being. So, sounds great on paper, right? A lot of times these things turn out to be nothing. But in this case, someone has done a trial in 82 patients where they gave half the men taxotere and the other half they gave them taxotere plus this RNA superglue called Kirsterson. And they showed the PSA drop about the same, maybe a little bit better. Any drop in PSA, well, looks a little better on this side. But overall survival, rather substantial improvement percentage-wise in, uh, in survival, almost uh, C3, 6, about 7 months uh, improvement in survival. And so the survival curve separated very significantly. And the side effects of this stuff seem to be quite trivial, because all it's doing is, is stopping a protein from, um, from ever existing. So this is the company that makes this stuff, is excited enough to, um, they now are going to start accruing a large trial. And I think if I was thinking about starting Taxotere for the first time, I'd probably want to do it in conjunction with that new uh, substance called Crispicin. Okay, so then let's just summarize. What have we learned about Taxotere tonight? We've all been in the Taxotere class. Have you ever been to a Taxotere class before? <laughs> the, um, so I didn't list all the things that don't seem to make that big a difference, but there's a lot of common medicines that if you use them with Taxotere by themselves, it doesn't make that big a difference. It's been tried. and um, So these are the kinds of things that you might try if all these have been tried and you just don't have any other ideas, but they're not too likely to give really good results. But uh, we did find that carboplatin with MSIN, capsetamine, the other name for that one was Zolota, that was the pill that's approved for breast cancer, Avastin when it's mixed with thalidomide or Revlimid. Revlimid is like the new generation of thalidomide. And then I mentioned Kirsterson. Exocelin is something that has uh, already been completed in trials, and this, um, we don't know the results yet, but they're probably going to tell us in the next few months if this is another medicine I'm not going to tell you about that may also improve Taxotere. So the people that made Taxotere, Sanofi and Venice, didn't let the grass grow under their feet. They, as soon as they got a big multi-billion dollar drug, they went out and said, well, let's make a better Taxotere. And they uh, recently published the results of 750 patients who had been treated with Taxotere, responded, but then the Taxotere later stopped working. These are a more stubborn type of cancer, and the type of cancer that's learned how to grow even when the Taxotere is on board. So they got 755 of these patients, and they gave half of them an old standby medicine, mitoxantrum, not particularly good, not very toxic either, reasonable thing to try. And then they compared it with this new medicine called Cabazitaxel, another name for that is Jeftana. And they um, were trying to show, once again, to the FDA that people will live longer with their new medicine, and they actually were able to show that quite nicely. And so as soon as the FDA saw this, um, I think we heard about this first maybe about four months ago, five months ago, and then this was FDA approved about two to three months ago. So we've started treating people with this new, new improved form of Taxotere. Uh, the, uh, these medicines are all expensive, and so the insurance companies are getting cleverer and cleverer. When I first got into this business, I could use any cancer medicine on any cancer patient that I chose. They figured, I guess, I'm a cancer expert. Maybe I know what I'm doing, but they don't believe that anymore. And so these days, you know, they approve medicines for each cancer type. So sometimes it's hard to get like a breast cancer medicine and use it in a prostate cancer patient. Not because you can't write a prescription, but because no insurance company will pay for it. And now more recently, we're starting to see a situation where they're not only approving medicines for each disease type, in other words for prostate but not breast and vice versa, now they're approving medicines for disease type and stage. So I can't give this medicine to anyone that hasn't already had Taxotere, but the insurance won't pay for it. So you'd think, gosh, this is a better medicine, why don't we, why don't we just leapfrog over Taxotere and start with the good stuff? That's always been a principle in oncology, use your good stuff first, get some results. You can't do it, no. And uh, I think the, you know, the realities are is that these medicines are getting more and more expensive, and everyone knows the big brouhaha that we're going through politically right now with where's the money, where'd the money go? 
So it's uh, so this is what we're seeing now that uh, us docs are being restricted more and more in what we're able to do. So this medicine is uh, the side effects are pretty similar to Taxotere. There was uh, some patients that had some low blood counts and some people got some diarrhea, but in the patients that we've used it, it's been very well tolerated and appears to be nice and effective. All right, so we're going to move out, uh, move out beyond now the. Uh, the chemotherapy stuff for prostate cancer, and talk a little bit about these new immune treatments that are coming along, and which is uh, amazing because this, uh, you know, really wasn't available to us even five years ago. So we've got a whole new category of medicines to consider, uh, which are almost always far less toxic than Taxotere and these types of medicines. So they have a, a great potential for not only helping people but doing it without impairing their quality of life. So the um, immune system, or harnessing the immune system, can be a challenging prospect because if you finally get something that's strong enough to really make the immune system go strong, you can start running into some of immune-related diseases that some of you may have heard about, like, uh, like lupus, or asthma, or pneumonitis, or rheumatoid arthritis, um, or different types of blood diseases. These things are pretty scary and sometimes deadly when the immune system runs out of control. The friendly message in all this is that, thank God, the immune system is still there and strong enough to make waves. A lot of people mistakenly think that they have cancer because their immune system is weak. It has nothing to do with cancer, the immune system being weak. The immune system is plenty strong to kill cancer. The trouble is the immune system is blind. It's not seeing the cancer cells. So it's just if a cancer cell is walking down the hall here and uh, coming this way and I start walking that way, we just walk right by each other. You know, normally you'd think I'd reach over and strangle it and kill it, but it, they just walk by and they just don't pay any attention to each other. So it's not that I'm not strong enough to take that cancer cell out, but the problem is that I'm just, for whatever reason, not seeing it or, or I see it as a friend rather than a foe. So the immune system is there for us if we can somehow get it interested in attacking the cancer cell, but we also have to keep in mind that if you rev up the immune system too much, you might actually create some problems. So, the, um, obviously we have to oversimplify this because the immune system is such a complex thing. And I think that we, we can get a couple good concepts across to you tonight. If you think about the, uh, what we call the T-cells in the immune system, these are the, the, uh, you know, the, the tank or the army of the, of the immune system that goes out and, and kills cancer cells or may kill viruses or whatever. So getting it pointed at the right thing is a very important issue, but what is it that we're pointing? And what we're really trying to rev up are the T-cells. They're called T-cells because they come originally from our thymus, a small gland in our chest. And, and then these cells, they go out and they, um, they latch on to tumor cells. These are natural killer cells here, type of T-cell. And, um, and they basically kill the cancer cells directly when they're working properly, that is. So, there's a kind of a recognition process that's necessary that gets messed up in the, in when people's immune systems don't work properly. When they do work properly, the, there's sort of a surface uh, irregularity on the cancer cells that our own immune cells are smart enough to recognize. And people have used the example of a, of a key fitting into a lock, that there's a certain unique configuration on the surface of these cancer cells that gets recognized by our immune cells, and then once they recognize it and swing into action, they're plenty powerful to kill the cancer cells. So those, that recognition happens through a, another cell called an APC, antigen presenting cell, or maybe you've heard something called dendritic cells. Uh, these are the cells, that are, they're like the brains of the system. They can go out and, and find these cancer cells. They nibble off recognition parts of the cancer cells, and then they talk to the T cells, the ones that go out and do the dirty work, and tell them the type of cells to attack. So the whole process starts with these antigen presenting cells. So you can think of then the antigen presenting cells are both the bloodhounds that go out and sniff out the cancer, and then they're like the cheerleaders for the T cells saying, go get them T cells, right? <laughs> so they fulfill two roles in this regard. Now, one of the biggest discoveries I think that we've seen in the last 10 to 15 years about how um, prostate cancer is, is getting out of control and why the immune system isn't doing what it should. 
is, is the discovery that there is a whole side to the immune system to keep our immune systems in check. You saw those pictures of those unfortunate people with those immune problems. By the way, I, picked, I didn't pick the worst pictures. I mean, they can get worse than that. And so, what happens uh, to keep that from happening, that the reason we don't all have our immune systems gobbling us up, is some regulatory cells, another form of T cell, but these are called T regs, T regulatory cells. And these cells go around, and if they see our immune system getting too excited, they go around, calm down, calm down, stop it, don't do that anymore. So they're sort of like the, the, the police of the immune system. Now, this, and this was not really recognized. You know, for years, I'm sure you heard, you know, they tried this vaccine, they tried that tr immune treatment, and it really never got off the ground. For 30 years, we knew how to stimulate the immune system to, you know, take care of viruses, you know, but for some reason, the idea of stimulating the immune system cancers just wasn't getting traction. And now we know that the reason this is, is those t Rex cells have been taken over to the dark side, so to speak. Quisling is a guy that sold out Norway to Hitler, you know, when he, when he saw that uh, Hitler was going to be taking things over, he, he just basically grabbed Norway and said, we're for Hitler. And they, they made him president for that. And of course, afterwards, they shot him. But it was, uh, <laughs> during the, um, during the, you know, he used to, his name is synonymous with traitor. And, and this is what is happening. The T-Rex cells are actually selling out to the cancer cells. We're not entirely sure of what this process is, but we've seen that T, the T-Rex cells, you know, police and suppress the immune system. They have shown over and over in cancer cell patients that they, cancer patients have more of these T-Rex cells than normal people. But there's, they're, they're increased in amount to, to suppress our immune systems. And they show that the higher the level of T-Rex cells in the blood, the shorter the survival. So these things are a real problem, and they're getting in the way of our immune system taking care of the cancer. So we're thinking then of the immune system as sort of in a balance. We want these T-Rex cells to keep the cancer, the immune system from getting out of control, but we don't want it to be so controlling that the immune system doesn't attack the cancer. So the laboratory people have done some miraculous things and they've actually figured out on these T-Reg cells what the switch is for turning them off and on. There's a little molecular switch on the surface that's been discovered, it's been isolated and purified. And they've been able to design antibodies that will switch it off. Pretty exciting, huh? So there's a way now with these medicines that they can actually take the T-Rex out, get rid of the T-Rex, these, these problem uh, cells that have been getting in the way. So what it looks like, the, the medicine uh, attaches to these surface switches called CTLA-4, and they, they've created an antibody that sort of sticks to it so that the switch can't get switched, um, can't get switched on. I think I'm going to skip through this so that... So this medicine that's been created is now owned by Bristol Myers. It's called Ipilumumab. I want you all to say that real quick. <laughs> Ipilumumab. It took me a month to learn how to say that right. So they've done, they did some preliminary work in prostate cancer. They showed that just with this medicine by itself, just to get rid of T-Rex cells, that there were patients would have PSA levels decline, that uh, they would get responses, and they did also see some side effects from the immune system getting uh, too revved up. Some people got some rashes, some people got some diarrhea. So things were really happening when the T-Rex cells were blocked. And this is just a PSA summary showing the responses that they got. The side effects of this are, are not trivial. So some patients, about 10, uh, well, uh, almost a third of the patients had diarrhea. Our biggest immune organism is, organ is our intestine believe it or not. It makes, it's logical. That's where everything that, from outside that is coming into your system. So all the vigilance of the immune system starts in the walls of the intestine. So when you release that immune system to be even more powerful, the most common side effect is some irritation in the test, intestine. You can also see effects on the skin and, the, uh, and with some of the endocrine organs. So um, this is um, very, very exciting. I mean, that we can find something that is uh, able to modulate our immune system so that it, our immune systems can start to do the work it was supposed to do from the start. 
Now this is a guy named Eugene Kwan from the Mayo Clinic, and he must be a pretty clever guy because one of the things he just uh, was aware of is that when we give plain old hormone treatments, we talked about Lupron and Castanex before that you're also familiar with, it turns out that a lot of the effect of Lupron and Castanex happens via the immune system. What happens when we block out testosterone is apoptosis occurs and the cells start to die. But those dead cells don't just sit there. The immune system has to come in like the janitor and clean it up. So a bunch of immune cells go right into the tumor when you give hormone treatment. So this guy talked to Bristol Myers and said, well what if we give some of this new medicine, epilumumab, to patients at the same time that we give them Lupron and Casadex, I think. I might have a, yeah. So this is, he, Dr. Kwan forwarded this little um, cartoon to me, illustrating here's the prostate, here's the bladder, and here's the cancer that's growing. And he only treated guys that had the bad type, the ones that were growing outside. So when he gave hormone treatments, we all know that hormone treatments can shrink the cancer down, but they don't usually get rid of all of it. So in his study, he took people with advanced disease and he gave them hormone treatments. So you can see these are the T cells coming in, killing some of the cancer, but then he gave one shot of this new medicine and the cancers regressed much, much more dramatically. He sent me the, the um, a bone scan of someone that he had treated who had a PSA of 250 before. You can see the spots of the cancer here. He's been, got hormone treatment plus one shot of this epilumumab and the bone scan almost completely normal and the PSA totally undetectable. So this is very preliminary stuff, but this, uh, Bristol Mars is very excited. They bought this medicine from a company called Metarex, I think, for two billion dollars. They thought, hey, this has potential. Let's spend two billion dollars on it. And so they have designed a trial for prostate cancer patients, which is now open, uh, where patients can volunteer to get um, either a placebo or ipilimumab. So the thing I don't like about trials, and this is all the FDA is doing, not the pharmaceutical companies. This is, remember the FDA will only prove a drug if you show someone lives longer. I guess that means someone lives shorter too, doesn't it? Uh, good old FDA, our government at work. But, uh, so some of the people are going to get a fake medicine, some will get this new ipilimumab medicine. So this trial is open and accruing, and uh, so for patients that, uh, that want to give this new medicine a try, it is a trial, it is presently available. The, um, let's see if it, uh, the type of people that are, are eligible have to have a, a, spot, a scan that shows a spot in the bone, the rising PSA, they have to already have uh, been on Lupron before, and uh, let's see, they can't have too much previous chemo, and you can't have any history of, of lupus or something like that. That's a kind of a scary thought. Because if someone has an overactive immune system already and then you add this on top of it, big trouble. All right, so I'll come back a little bit more to uh, some other immune stuff in a minute. Uh, 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 well, actually, this is an immune or anything, but I want to talk, we've been talking about people with advanced disease or cancer in their bones, hormone refractory. But there's even more patients who have had surgery or radiation and their PSA levels are starting to rise and the typical thing that happens is they go on Lupron and Castanex. And Lupron and Castanex can keep the PSA down for many years but that has side effects. And so the usual thing is to start and stop the medicines intermittently to improve quality of life. And people live for a long time. I, I'd love to illustrate how different the survival is from prostate cancer that's relapsed, in other words, a rising PSA, compared to most other common cancers. And we know this, this is why the word cancer is so frightening to us, is that the average survival of pancreas cancer is about four months. And the average survival of stomach cancer is about eight months, if it comes back. If someone has surgery, and then the cancer comes back, it's really, really, really bad. Prostate cancer, the average survival is 160 months, and it turns out that in a 70-year-old man, that's about the normal life expectancy of someone. So with relapse disease. So the mortality rates of PSA relapse disease are not very high. You do have to have a PSA relapse to ever die of prostate cancer, but historically only about one out of five men that relapse ever does die of prostate cancer. And that one out of five men that does end up dying usually is 10 to 15 years in the future. 
because the, the Lupron and Castadex and other treatments are so effective in, in postponing that day. So people are going to give a, live a long time with hormone treatments, so their quality of life is so critical. And so one of the things that, as I mentioned, is that people use the hormones intermittently rather than continuously to give people holidays. This is called intermittent treatment, so they would get treatment for a period, PSA goes down, stop treatment, over time testosterone comes back and PSA starts to rise again. The other way to think of it is that after the treatment is stopped, the PSA starts rising, and then if there's something that we can do to slow the rate of rise, if we're going to restart at some point, then we can buy them more time off of the hormone treatments. Hormones cause people to be tired, lose their sex drive, gain weight, hot flashes, and these sorts of things. So the longer the holiday period, the better the quality of life. So there's a lot of things that seem to work by an immune mechanism that slow the rate of PSA rise. This was first reported by Dr. Eric Small and his group up at the University of California, San Francisco. And they, they just did a small study, 29 men that had rising PSAs, and seven of the 29 men that were treated with this immune medicine that was FDA approved for uh, chemotherapy back in the 1990s had stabilization of their PSAs for five years. So they went on Lupron and Castadex, they stopped. PSA started going up, 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 went on Leukine. Seven of the patients had just leveled off and didn't rise for five years. It wasn't that it start, stopped working after five years, they just thought, well, we better write this up because we don't know if it will ever start rising. So, not everybody, but a certain number of the patients had very, very durable responses. Now, since that has very few, if any, side effects, it's very logical to think, well, if that stimulates the immune system and helps seven of 29 men, what about other things that might stimulate the immune system? And so there's a medicine that's been around for many years, so long ago that they named it the era where patients didn't know the name of things. So that's why they could get away with a name like cytoxin. You know, who would ever allow something like that to be put into your body? So it was the doctors knew about that, the patients would just take the pill, they were told. So this was FDA approved like 35 years ago or something like that. So, but now it, they've discovered that if you give very, very small doses, that the T-Rex, remember the regulatory cells that are teaming up with the cancer? and, and uh, inhibiting the immune system. For some reason, this stuff is selectively poisonous to those T-Reg cells. And this is a fairly recent discovery. And the nice thing is that it's in such small amounts that there are really hardly any, if any, side effects. So, rather logical, why don't we give this that gets rid of T-Regs and add it to the leukine. Neither has any significant side effects, so it's easy to do. And then a, a third approach, a medicine that uh, blocks angiogenesis called um, Celebrex. How many have heard of Celebrex? Celebrex is FDA approved to treat arthritis. And it is also, it also has a modest anti-cancer effect which is believed to work by uh, stimulating the immune system. So, a third medicine that could be added in combination, I'm not going to go through the details, these are small trials showing the effectiveness of Celebrex. But uh, back, uh, I think it was about, mm, must have been five years ago, I'm not sure, something like that. Uh, we had a patient who um, had been off and on hormone therapy for a number of years. So his story was, uh, he was 52 year old, 1995. PSA started coming up three months after surgery. And he went on, not Casadex and Lupron, but Flutamide and Lupron. And we, I don't think we had Casadex in 96. So he would be treated for a year or so, a year and a half, and then stop, take a holiday, PSA would come up. And the average length of those cycles for the treatment and the holiday was about three years. His PSA doubling time during the holiday was about six months. So every six months the PSA would double very predictably. And each time the PSA got back up to two, we would restart him on his Lupron and Flutamide, and later I think Lupron and Castex. So if you graph that out, you can say, okay, the PSA starts at 2, you go on treatment the first time, drops down to 0, stop the treatment, Here's the treatment is the yellow bars of the hormones, Lupron and Castadex or Flutamide. PSA comes up, 38 months later, go on a second course of hormones, PSA drops, stop treatment here, PSA rises, start treatment the third time, PSA drops, stop treatment, PSA rises, 
fourth time, start treatment, you say drops. So this is typical classical intermittent therapy. They give a person holiday times. You can see how long this has been going on. I mean, this guy's a healthy accountant. He's working full time. Um, you know, as far as I know, no one knows that he has prostate cancer. So, but back, I don't know, it must have been four or five years ago, we said, well, we are, I guess we kind of know what's going to happen. I mean, <laughs> we've been through this, we stop, PSA rises. Why don't we try and give you some of these mild immune medicines that don't have any side effects and see what might happen. And lo and behold, his fourth cycle, each of these was about three years, three years, three years, three years. This one was five years. So he got an extra, what, two years of holiday before his PSA got back up to, uh, we didn't even wait until it got to two, I think we started when it came up to one. So without hardly any side effects at all that I can recall, he, um, he was able to get a much longer holiday period through these very modest immune treatments. And so we've done this in a number of people. We reported this at the uh, annual cancer meetings this year. Uh, 24 men that had their pretty brisk doubling times. The average time their PSA would double when they stopped their Lupron was four months. We found that 14 of the 24 men had at least 100%, at least 100% increase in their doubling time. And the, I think the average doubling time in the 14 responders was, was like four months or something like that before treatment. It was like 20 months after treatment in the responders. So it, it makes a big difference. These people can take much longer holiday periods without any significant uh, side effects. Now what we're working on, you heard about thalidomide before, and um, thalidomide's been shown to be active in the same way. It works by an immune uh, process. I'm going to jump through these because too much. Um, so, but other people have said, well, let's try and combine stuff. Leukine was one of those things that we use. And when, in this particular study, 10 men were treated with uh, rising PSAs. And when it was, thalidomide was combined with leukine, all 10 of the men had at least a 50 to 80% decline in, um, in PSA. So, this, the activity of this substance is exciting, except thalidomide. How many have heard of thalidomide? Yeah, the baby killer, right? Great stuff to take. Well, I don't know how they ever gave it to pregnant women because it's pretty toxic stuff. Makes, makes you really groggy, causes severe constipation. So the company Celgene that makes this stuff came up with new improved thalidomide. It's called uh, Revlimid. And this is available in low doses. It turns out that it has a lot of the good properties of thalidomide with, with almost none of the bad ones. So this is something that you can take on an ongoing basis and not feel sick. And so we've been using a combination now when people are going us. We don't give them merely leukine and celebrex and cytoxin, but we also add a little revlimid. It's a pill. Um, you take one a day. And we're seeing very frequent extended stabilization of PSA in men that previously had steadily rising PSAs um, before, um, you know, when they come off their hormones. We've even started using this in some men that have never had hormones for their have surgery or radiation, the PSA is going up, and they say, okay, the cancer is back. And the, we present this option as an alternative to the hormones because the hormones have the unpleasant side effects that I've talked about before. Okay, so I want to talk about the newest, the most exciting thing in the field of immune therapy. Um, medicine was FDA approved about three or four months ago. They, um, take some of your uh, remember the cheerleader and the bloodhound cells, the antigen presenting cells? They have the technology to filter those out of your blood. So you can go through a kind of a dialysis type process and they can take those antigen presenting cells out of your blood and put it in a bag. And right now they're flying it back to New Jersey and processing those cells. What they're doing is they're force feeding them uh, tumor recognition, recognition antigens. In other words, bits of cancer that are on the surface of the cancer cells so that these recognition cells learn what the scent is. It's like giving the bloodhounds the scent. And then once that is done, this, uh, this uh, tumor antigen is called, uh, it's actually half leukine, to kind of juice it up, and half PAP. I mentioned PAP earlier as a blood test that's sometimes used to check uh, for prostate cancer. It's a, PAP is very commonly present on the surface of, cancer, of prostate cancer cells. So they 
They feed that to these cells in a lab. Your cells, living in a bag, they feed these cells with this uh, PAP leukine analog. And what happens then is that they, antigen presenting cells, when they're put back into your body, they talk to the T cells and they say, this is the type of cancer cell to kill, the one that has PAP on it. And then the T cells uh, multiply and, and spread around the body. So, I don't know if the, this is going to be very clear. I have a, a video, and I, the only thing I'm concerned about, I don't know if it's going to be loud enough to hear, I may have to take my microphone off. And, but if it works, it's pretty cool. Let me see if we can make this work. Second trial, the FDA just couldn't 
just plain couldn't believe it, right? The, the, the immune treatment actually made people live longer. So they made them do it a second time. And again, they showed separation and survival. People lived longer when they got the real stuff as opposed to placebo. And that still wasn't enough, so they made them do it a third time. And on the third occasion, again, they showed a survival advantage. I don't have the curve yet for this, but uh, they, uh, this was published in the New England Journal in July. And uh, so they had three randomized perspective trials that showed a, um, an improvement in survival with this medicine that has virtually no side effects. The, um, the confusing thing is, is that it's not uh, obvious in the way taxidermy causes PSAs to drop. Remember we said that if you see a 30% drop in PSA on taxidermy, the chemotherapy, it's working. Stay with it, keep going. And if you don't see a 30% drop, it's not working. Now, we don't really have to make that decision in ProVenge because we don't just keep giving it. You get three treatments and you're finished. So it's not like Taxotere where you keep giving it, keep giving it. Um, but what has been observed in terms of PSA declines is not that many. So they can show that people that get ProVenge live longer, but they're not showing uh, any predictable or consistent sudden drop in PSA, which confuses everybody a bit. The way I've kind of come to understand it is that uh, sort of like the that curve I showed you with the growth growth rates or how fast PSA rises. I suspect what's happening is that people that have a cancer growing at a certain rate they're getting ProVenge and that the rate of growth is being slowed but not stopped. So this is why with slower slowing of the growth of the cancer, people are living longer. But it, it, but dramatic responses where it's just like the PSA is going away. We haven't seen that yet. We have seen some patients whose PSAs are going down, uh, but we really don't know how long to wait for that sort of thing. And so in many cases, what we'll do is after they get the ProVenge, if we don't see stabilization in PSA pretty promptly, we'll treat them with other things. And this is what happened in the original ProVenge trial, that people were treated with additional medicines afterwards, but the men that got the ProVenge did better than those that didn't. So what I think is exciting is that because it has no side effects, it's a natural thing to consider for adding or combining it with other immune treatments. And the, uh, remember when we, uh, we were able to kick Hitler out of um, France, um, we always think of D-Day, but a lot of men had, uh, had taken up a lot of Hitler's army over here in Italy, fighting their way up here. And then the Russians were coming in from this angle, and that was how Hitler was defeated, by attacking from different angles simultaneously. And these medicines, the ones we talked about, GMCS, the same as leukine, uh, lotocytoxinibulum, these medicines in theory could be given in conjunction with ProVenge. And one reason that ProVenge uh, may be getting a substantial but not a dramatic effect is something that isn't being dealt with, and those are the T-Rex. T-Rex, remember they want to juice up the APC cells outside the body because they were aware of the fact that there are T-Rex in the body that are suppressing the immune system. So they take the APC cells out of the body, stimulate them, and then reinfuse them. But now with medicines like ipilimumab or lotocytoxin, we can take out the T-Rex, and I strongly suspect, this is not been tested yet, but that ProVent is going to work much better when it's given in conjunction with some of these other immune things at the same time. So, some preliminary studies have been done. Remember, Avastin was the angiogenesis inhibitor. So, people have combined Avastin with ProVenge in one very small trial, starting with much earlier disease. And uh, they showed that, uh, you know, these are men that had PSA doubling times of seven months, that the average doubling time went up by 100% in all 22 men. 43% of men had PSA declines. So, there are people that are, uh, have worked on this, this idea, and of course, ipilimumab is the one the open trial that's been combined with leukine. And when they combine these things in, a, it's just a small group of six men, over um, uh, three of the six men have dramatic declines in PSA. So it's just an area that's starting to take off. Um, so I want to reiterate once more that treatment for uh, people with uh, advanced prostate cancer, relapsed prostate cancer, has to be individualized. You can't just go by a study and say, oh, it, worked, it added four months to someone's survival, as if that defines it. You know, this is, a, you know, if everyone that went to, uh, to UCLA was a, was a star, 
and everyone that went to, to Podunk Phil University was a jerk. You know, we could just, oh, you went to that college, you must be a, a good person, and you're a bad person. We can't use these broad, sweeping strokes in deciding what treatments to use. What really has to happen is we have to try things in a sort of a trial and error fashion, monitor patients extremely closely with all the tools that are, uh, that are available to us, and then decide in that individual if they're benefiting from that treatment. You can't just make these sweeping generalizations. So what I foresee is we're going to see the same pattern happening in cancer that we've seen in other common diseases like diabetes, hypertension, and whatnot, where my uh, great-grandfather died at about age 70 of uncontrolled um, blood pressure. They didn't have good blood pressure medicines back then. And uh, he was, uh, you know, that was, just, that was just the course of things. And uh, now, you know, they then discovered a single blood pressure medicine, a second, a third. We developed less toxic ones. We could combine them. And these days, we can control just about anybody's blood pressure, and they're able to go on with a normal life. And I think this is what's going to happen in cancer. We're going to see, we're getting, starting to get these non-toxic medicines that have effectiveness. They're going to get more effective, but more importantly, we're going to be able to safely combine them together so that we can get even bigger benefits than just using one by themselves. So, I think sometimes you guys take questions for a little while afterwards, or how do you all do that here? Since I think that was my last slide. Yeah. Is this Mike? Grant? Grant? Okay. Yeah, uh, we do take questions. Uh, if anybody has any questions from Dr. Schultz, come on up and uh, we'll take them uh, one person at a time, obviously. Dave, come on up. Oh, I come down off my mouth Oh, Dr. Schultz, could you please stand up there? I can. <laughs> God, I tried. So I don't, I don't have to chase you. Okay. Can, can just, I stand in front? You're, that's good, is, but I, I hope that you don't move around too much. I'll try not to fall off. Well, first of all, thank you so much for fascinating, very encouraging talk. But my question is really simple, maybe. Uh, it doesn't apply, but when you were talking about the immune system being able to handle uh, cancer, but it's interfered with by things like the T-Rex or whatever, if you're just using these, you know, we're talking, you're talking mainly about intermediate and, and, and high uh, cases of prostate, why couldn't these immune uh, uh, boosting products be used for low or medium grade? Well, it's a natural question because that's how most treatments evolve in cancer. First, they're tried in people with advanced disease, and when they're shown to be effective, people logically conclude that it'll work even better in someone who's, whose disease is not in control. The, uh, the reason I think that that will happen, but there's uh, several things that slow it down. One is the um, people with early stage prostate cancer have such low mortality rates that you have to be very careful and twisting the dials on the immune system because what if 5, 10, 15 years from now this had other unanticipated effects? And if you treated someone that has a little tiny prostate cancer that's never going to die of it, um, you know, you're going to have a potential ethical problem. That's one problem. Uh, the other has to do with just the uh, expense of the medicines and the expense of treating early stage patients because our FDA is stuck on this idea of survival. So if the survival of someone with early stage prostate cancer is 15 to 20 years, which company can design a trial in men that have a 15 to 20 year survival and then show an improvement? It's just impractical. You know, we'll all be died of old age by then. So, uh, so there's some real problems. What usually happens is that over time these medicines become more affordable and that individual practitioners or small studies are done at different universities and volunteers uh, participate and uh, sometimes when medicines are so effective, it becomes just like a, a no-brainer. The example I think of is, how, how many of you have heard of a type of radiation called IMRT? IMRT. There are no randomized prospective trials showing that IMRT is better than 3D conformal or old-time radiation techniques. And IMRT just burst on the scene about six, seven, eight years ago, and it was so obviously better than everything else that all the doctors just started using it. Everyone was loath to use the old stuff, which was causing rectal burns and all these terrible side effects. And so it just 
It just was obvious. In other words, the treatment was so good that they didn't need to do one of these survival studies to, you know, you really only have to do those survival studies when there's a, an improvement, but it's not a real big improvement to make that distinction, to, to show that it's real. When you show a really big difference, it's kind of obvious to everybody. So we're waiting for that. I don't think the differences right now with these immune treatments are that obvious, but I think that it's a potential that it will become that obvious at some point. Well, again, now you're talking, you addressed it back to me as the, you know, early stage. How about the intermediate stage? You know, how does this apply to the intermediate stage? Uh, well, I think the only thing, like for instance with PSA relapse patients, I think the thing that is holding us back with the ProBench is that it was approved as a stage-specific treatment. Uh, the, uh, it's quite expensive. The company is charging a lot for it. And so only people that have developed hormone resistance and have at least a measurable spot of cancer somewhere are, uh, can get insurance to pay for it. Now, if you have uh, you know, a lot of gold sitting in your closet, you can buy it. It's, it's available, but it's so expensive that that creates a real barrier. So then I, the only reason, like for me, you know, I have intermediate stage, which is, you know, it, it's, it's really tough to make decisions what I should do. And yet you're talking about, you know, my, my immune system being able to at least minimize the growth of it. And at this stage, that's all I'd like to see because they said there's not that much to go. So I don't understand why that's not available. Uh, oh, I think it's available. Uh, like I said, it's very expensive, and I think that for people not, we're not talking about, we're talking about early stage prostate cancer. Um, the, um, you know, it's really, it has, it's a, it's a nice idea, but no one's ever done it. It's not proven. So it's, I think it's very hard for people to think about spending large sums of money for uh, something that we don't know is going to help uh, do work better at an earlier stage. It, it may. It, those uh, tests haven't been done yet. Okay, um, you still. <laughs> you know, these, are, these are the realities. Well, the when you talk about, stage we're not dealing with. You when know, you talk about stage. treating early stage uh, well, patients, I, if anything goes wrong, there was a, a university back east that got the idea of giving immune treatments to early stage patients, and a couple of people died. They have no further research at that university. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Harry. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, how many of these new medications that you described this evening are being looked at from the aspect of the response of the medication to the DNA of the patient? <clears throat> I think the only one I mentioned was the Kirsterson, was the, that it works at the DNA level. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah. In other words, um, the, the others may also be working at the D DNA level, might they not? I mean, if you have, let's say, a 10% response that is very excellent, maybe that population has something in their DNA that, that is responsible for that. Well, most of the medicines that we talked about tonight, we know how they work. Yeah. And they work by blocking uh, the protein function, not the Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Uh, second quick question. In your blood test that you mentioned, uh, there was one blood test that you went over very quickly that defined uh, small cancer cells. I've heard of that in lung cancer, and you know, they're more aggressive. Is there any such thing as small cell prostate cancer? Yes, absolutely, and it's a very serious variant. Fortunately, uh, you know, at any one time in our practice, Dr. Lamb and I are managing about 1,500 men with prostate cancer, actively managing. And at this time, we don't have a single patient that has a small cell variant. Unfortunately, many times people with a small cell variant don't live very long. It's a very, very aggressive type of prostate cancer. So I would say we see a case of small cell prostate cancer maybe every other year, something like that. One case out of the 1,500, and we're a referral center, so people with difficult cases tend to come to us in the first place. So fortunately, I think it's a lot more rare than people realize. Thank you. <coughs> For a great talk tonight. I agree with uh, you know, those that have complimented you on it. It seems like a, a, a real breakthrough is kind of in the air, and that's kind of refreshing after seven, eight years of looking at this. I kind of see a, a new dawn, maybe. 
A couple of quick questions. The, uh, I think that the last uh, the last speaker we had uh, mentioned a an outfit on the East Coast that analyzes genetic makeup of the pros prostate cancer cell. I can't remember that. Harry, do you remember the name? Ariot. 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 Mm -hmm. Do you have any comment on, on that as a yeah. Pro prognostic? Yeah, uh, uh, Arion provides two services. One is that they analyze the cells and the Gleason and all that normal stuff. Uh, and they add a couple of uh, useful tests, one to measure an antigen receptor and the other to measure how fast the cancer cells is growing. Uh, I think the most valuable service they provide is for people that aren't doing prostate cancer full time. They take all this information, they jumble it together, and they say, this is how bad it is. Okay? And, the, and you know, in my practice, we have to do this sort of analysis all day long, so having someone do my punch the buttons on the calculator for me doesn't really give me a lot of new information. Uh, the, so I personally don't find it that useful in my day-to-day -day practice. But I think that you know, your doctors that are doing some prostate cancer and they're doing some uh, you know, bladder resuspensions and they're doing uh, penis enlargement and they're doing all these other things and doing a little prostate cancer, I think it's a very helpful thing. Fair enough. Uh, I read in one of the publications about nitroglycerin being used. Is there any effectiveness there? There's one trial showing that transdermal nitroglycerin seems to slow the rate of PSA rise. The, uh, it's an intriguing thing because this is what's used for people that have angina. It doesn't really have any side effects. It sounds really exciting. In the trial, I was a little confused though. I told you in the studies that we're doing, patients typically had an a PSA doubling time of four months or six months, you know, you can clearly see the PSA is going up so that when you give something and it stops going up, you know something happened. The average doubling time in that study of the nitroglycerin patients uh, was like 18 months before you treated them. And it went up to 36 months after you treated them. You kind of, I don't know how to interpret that kind of information. So at some, at some point, we should try treating. We haven't done it. Uh, pick men that have faster doubling times and see if it's effective. But that kind of discouraged me because it sounded to me like they're treating men that didn't need treatment. To show a, an effect in treatment when men that don't need treatment doesn't really say a lot to me. So. And then finally, uh, I ask you this every time you're here. Uh, any, any great stuff on the, in the future that we can look forward to? You did a great job of telling us what's here now. But those of us that like to wish out over the gray, but is there anything on the horizon that looks really, really promising? Well, I, I think the, the most promising thing is, uh, you know, I have to tip my hat to uh, Michael Milken and his Prostate Cancer Foundation. Uh, he's raised three or four hundred million dollars directly for research over the last 15 years. And he's made sure that the money gets channeled into really smart researchers. And what happens when I tell you about how Epilumumab works and how Kirstison works, this is the, the, the result of people doing an immense amount of lab research to figure out what cancer is. And I think the most exciting thing about the future is that it's pretty much getting figured out. And now it's just a matter of, you know, that we know how to build bridges, now we've got to go out and build the bridges. And it's an expensive and time-consuming process because you're doing research in humans. And that has, can only be done in certain very well-circumscribed ways. It's going to take time. But compared to when I first got into this business 20 years ago, the medicines that we gave were basically uh, just poisons and we had no idea how they worked. But the way they developed things at the NCI back then is they would take, you know, like floor wax and, and, and you know, iron do stuff like that. They'd throw it into a, a petri dish with cancer cells growing. Ah, oh, they die. And then they would take that same substance and then they'd give it to an animal with cancer. And if the cancer seemed to get, you know, better and the, cancer, and the animal didn't die, then they gave it to people. And no one even knew how they worked. And there was about half a dozen of these things on the market when I came into the business. And it was a, just a dark, dismal time. I got into this business on faith that there would be a better day. And I think that day is coming now. But it's, uh, so I think the exciting thing is that we understand what's going on with these cancer cells. And so, and as long as we keep the, I'll put in a plug for the free market system, as long as we can keep those pharmaceutical companies greedy and out there researching, because that's where most of the research is, not the government dollars that make the big difference. It's motivated entrepreneurs to go out and think they can, you know, become a millionaire. And uh, they, they're the ones that do all the hard work. It is so hard to get these products on the market. It's unbelievably difficult. But I think that now that we understand what's going on, there's tremendous hope for the future in designed solutions.
I think that's really, the really probably the most exciting thing. Hi, you mentioned taking a hormone therapy holiday. Do you wait for PSA to be 0 0.0 or 0 0.5 okay, 0 0.8 okay? How, did, how do you decide? Uh, in our experience, men that can get their PSAs down to less than 0 0.1 or maybe preferably 0 0.05, that's half of 0 0.1, uh, those men tend to do very well when they take a holiday. Men that have trouble getting their PSAs that low on Lupron and Casadex, not just Lupron alone, they have a tendency for developing hormone resistance. It's called a high PSA nadir. So our usual policy is to try and get the PSA down below, at least below 0.1. So if it doesn't get to the 0.1, you just keep taking? Well, we'll generally do, if the PSA level's off above 0.1 with, say, Lupron and Casadex, what we'll do is we'll stop the Casadex and we'll uh, try another product like maybe nilutamide. Um, and I think as soon as this abiraterone product is on the market, that's going to be really popular in that setting as well. Uh, because we've used a lot of ketoconazole, but ketoconazole has a lot of side effects. So abiraterone is going to be a real, real, real popular medicine. Thank you very much for coming and sharing the up to date information with us. Why? Uh, are pa cancer patients not being treated with a less toxic taxotere after surgery? And instead, you know, let's wait and see, and quality of life, and lukewarm and casadex. Right. And well, it's the same like we do with breast cancer patients, like we do with breast yes, cancer right. patients, like we do with lung cancer patients. And I think the reason that uh, we don't give chemotherapy right after surgery is that unlike breast cancer and colon, breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, is the mortality rates after surgery for prostate cancer are so, so much lower. Mortality rates are so low that only a certain sub-select group, people with really high Gleason scores, really high PSAs, or cancer that's proven outside the prostate, those are the men that can benefit from, say, taking taxotere right after. And that is not uniformly offered around the country, but it is offered. Uh, if, if someone came to our practice in that setting, we would discuss that possibility. But thankfully, those type of people with a more aggressive type, more advanced type of prostate cancer aren't as common as they used to be. And so, that's the good news. But for the group of men that do have a more advanced type, I think that should be offered and it, it can be done. Yeah, but at the end, it doesn't make any difference whether you have slow colon cancer or advanced cancer, you're all in the same boat. No, it's not true. Absolutely not true. Uh, the men with low-risk prostate cancer, what's defined, you have to get my book to understand what that is. Low Gleason score, low PSA, and no big bumps when you feel the prostate. Those men have a better chance of living 10 years than men that have never been diagnosed with prostate cancer. Okay. And the reason for that is because they're in the medical system. They get their blood pressure checked, they get a colonoscopy, they, so the mortality rate from low-risk prostate cancer is lower than men that don't even have a diagnosis of prostate cancer. So to give these men chemotherapy would be ridiculous, right? Well, um, in my mind, it's ridiculous. I'm glad I'm the doctor and you're not. <laughs> ridiculous for me. But the second question is: once you're on chemo. Why do you get only holidays? Why is there not intermittent or versus total chemo? Sure. Well, because as you give chemotherapy, like tax care, month after month after month after month, it wears people down. The most common side effect from long term tax care is tiredness. And these gentlemen that are getting the treatment already have low testosterone levels, so they're already tired. And then you add the tax care on top of it, they're doubly tired. So, and many times they're elderly people, 75 to 80, 85 year old men, sometimes they're on treatment. So you put all that together, and it's, at a certain point there's a limit to what people can take. Well, I, I still didn't get any uh, sense of why, do you, why don't you stop at 10 treatments or 15 treatments? Sometimes we do. Uh, in men that are, um, I mean, the, the typical, the question is, once you start taxotere and you give this, uh, what's the best time to take a holiday? And in the old days, uh, the, uh, when I was first starting out, we never took holidays. We were afraid to stop treatment. We figured if it was working, you better keep doing it. 
But we subsequently discovered that just like with hormone treatment, you can, after a period of time, stop the taxi chair or the other chemo and take a holiday and then restart it again and then you'll be able to recapture the uh, cancer in many cases. And so we never tell people you're going to take this for three months, six months, 12 months. We tell patients we're going to see how it works and of course we'll see how you feel. And then it's a combination of those two things that determine how long you continue the chemotherapy. Thanks. It's called individualized care. <laughs> Revolutionary thought. <laughs> yes, patients have to be proactive. Uh, I just want to say something. First of all, I want you to know that Dr. Schultz is my doctor. He's been my doctor for a long time. I feel very blessed to have a doctor like him. And the other thing uh, I wanted to share is I think this was an outstanding lecture by Dr. Schultz tonight. And <laughs> Hopefully, I've captured it on video, and uh, I'll know very soon. And I plan to edit this and turn it onto DVDs, and I will have them available before Thanksgiving. And if, if any of you would like to get an early copy, if you see me and give me fifteen dollars as soon as it's done, I'll mail it to you. So I just wanted to let you know that because I think this is so important, this information that, that Dr. Schultz is here. Thank you very much. Okay.